Hello everyone. If you can hear me, please let me know in the comments that you can hear me clearly. And then we'll start today's discussion. Okay, looks like everything is fine. And welcome to this discussion we are going to have about Pesky. I'm not sure how many of you are doing Pesky for the first time and how many of you have already done it. If possible, please let me know in the chat so that I can decide how I need to customize my discussion for today. Okay, so first time, first time. Okay, first time. Okay, in that case, let me first briefly tell you what PACE is all about. Uh, in Australia, if you want to practice as a general practice now, and if you don't have a general registration, then you'll have to do PACE You can do PACE after AMC step one and also after step two. The only difference will be after step one, you'll be doing it for your limited registration, whereas after step two, you'll be doing it for your provisional res registration. So that is the only basic difference. Now, there are three providers at the moment who provide uh, the basic training program, RCGP, Akram, and IME. I did my PASCI with IME, so whatever I discuss today will be mainly about uh, what happens with IME or how they run their PASCI interview and what you are expected to do and how you need to prepare for that. If you have any questions, you can ask me when I'm discussing or you can ask me at the end. So let me first show you what we are going to discuss today. So these are the topics of discussion for today. In addition to these topics, if you have anything else that you want to ask, or you want to discuss, please let me know. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. So first thing that I want to discuss today is what you really need to pass this exam based on my experience. And then after that, we'll talk about Okay, uh, I think there is a bit of a problem. Mary cannot hear me. What about the rest of you? Can you hear me? Okay, maybe I I misunderstood what she was trying to say. Anyway, um, so first I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what you really need to pass this exam based on my experience, what I did and how I felt about what I did. And then after that, I will also talk about what I think you do not need to pass the exam. And then after that, I will talk about the preparation method I used. So I'll show you uh, the different note taking methods I used, different uh, technologies I used and how I used them to learn about different things required for this exam. And then we'll briefly talk about what happens in the PASCI exam, which might be useful for someone who is doing it for the first time. But for the others who have already done it, perhaps it will be a little bit redundant. And I'm sorry about that, but we need to talk about that as well, especially for the beginners. Then at the end, we'll talk about the cases I got in the exam, the four cases I got, how I responded to those cases, and how the panels asked me questions, what questions they asked, and how I answered those questions. And then we'll have a Q&A session where you can ask me questions freely. Okay, so that's the plan for today. If anyone else has anything else to ask or share, please feel free. I want to move to the next slide now. Does anyone have any questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions if you have any questions at all. All right, so let's move to the first slide. And that is what I think you need to pass this exam. Now, some of you may have already taken some courses. You may have learned different kind of things from your tutors. And I don't want to negate any of the things you may have early, learned earlier because everyone may have had different impressions and different experience in the exam. So you have to 
analyze everything I say with a pinch of salt and make sure that um, it uh, it is applicable in your case as well. Because if it works for me or if, if it worked for me, doesn't mean that it will work for you as well. So try to think um, uh, about this in a general manner so that you get an overview of what I think this exam is about. Now, in the exam, what happens is that you uh, have a panel and the panel asks, uh, panel gives you a task, you do the task, and then the panels might intervene every now and then to ask you questions or to guide you towards certain directions. And then the interview runs for around one hour. And then after that, uh, within two weeks of your exam, you will get your result as well. The result uh, includes assessment of different domains, uh, which includes, so I'll show you my uh, result to explain to you what they consist of. So in your assessment, they look into your medical interviewing skills, your physical examination skills, clinical judgment, treatment and advice, communication skills, professionalism. And procedural skills, because it was an online exam and I was not asked to do any procedures, so of course that was not relevant. And there is one more thing, like if there were any additional things which were assessed in the exam. So they, these things are included in your final outcome report. And then they recommend to APRA whether um, you are suitable to work in the level you have been assessed for or not. And that's how it is done. So this, based on this, I'm, I'm going to talk about the things, important things I think we need for this exam. You can clearly see here, if you look at the components of the analysis of score, perhaps you can clearly see that what they expect from you. First is interviewing the skills. That means this is basically about history taking, physical examination. Now, what is this clinical judgment and how is this assessed? This is another thing that um, some people find a little bit confusing. So how do I show that my clinical judgment skill is good? I'll talk about this in more detail later on, but I think this was one of my strong points in the exam because when I was doing the exam, I did not know about this part because I did not take any courses. I did not take any class. I'm not sure if your tutors have already told you about these things, but I did not know about clinical judgment as one of the components of assessment. But when I was answering the questions, I was also explaining my thought process, how I came to that conclusion, why I was saying that every time I answered panel's questions, I told him why I thought in that way. And that's what clinical judgment is all about. If you look here carefully, what you can see is selectively orders, performs appropriate diagnostic studies, considers risks and benefits, arrives at an accurate diagnosis, a differential diagnosis, and identifies effective management strategies. So when I was doing my cases, which I'll show you later, I talked about these things. I, whenever I was saying I'm going to do this test, I didn't just say that I will do this test. I also explained that I want to do this test and I think this is what we will get. And if I find this test positive, then I'll follow this up with this test. So that's how I was explaining things. And I think that was something they were looking for as well. Then treatment advice. And if you look at this part, they say the rational. So every time you are explaining to the patient uh, any kind of treatment, you have to tell them what treatment advice you are giving and why. And again, this thing I did not know, but I was doing, although I didn't know about it. And that was perhaps another plus point in my case. Uh, one of my friends was asking me, because I, I applied for level one supervision, but they gave me level two supervision, if you can see here. And one of my friends was asking me, what did you do differently in the exam? When I did the exam, I didn't do anything differently because I did not even know what to do differently. But now in retrospect, if I think about the things I did, I can see that these were some of the things which may have helped me in getting assessment at this level. And communication skills, basically it means that you can articulate clearly, you can speak in a professional manner, respecting the patient and so on. And professionalism is basically um, this thing. So there is a book. Uh, good medical practice, a code of conduct for doctors in Australia. So your behaviors are consistent with that. I don't think anyone will have any problem with this because most of us have already worked in a clinical setting before as well. So perhaps we know how to do this, but uh, this is another thing they look into. And this is not something that you directly demonstrate. This is something that becomes evident in your approach, the way you do, you do things. Now, based on these things, what I feel are important to pass this exam are, the first is definitely your knowledge. If you don't know what to say, it doesn't matter how you say it. That's not going to get you the score you're looking for, or I mean, 
will help you to achieve the positive outcome. You should know about the cases. You should have adequate knowledge to deal with different cases that you get in the exam. What that means is when you are preparing for this exam, make a list of chief complaints that we usually get in the exam. Rather than just simply relying on the recalls and memorizing the positive findings of the recalls, the best way to prepare for this exam, I think, is to get a list of the positive, I mean, chief complaints, and then think about the chief complaints, the differential diagnosis based on those chief complaints. And then think about how would you differentiate one diagnosis from the other? What would you expect in the clinical features, in the clinical signs, uh, in the how would you do the investigations to differentiate one from the other? So you should have a good basic understanding of these things. You are also expected to know about the differential diagnosis. In my exam, I was not directly asked about differential diagnosis at any time. Uh, maybe because I was already talking about that whenever I was explaining the diagnosis. And that's why they did not feel the need to ask me about the differential diagnosis. But this is another thing. When you are talking about the differential diagnosis, it's very important that you put in the put them in the order of likelihood. And also, you think about the urgency of the possible differential diagnosis. Because one of my friends who shared her outcome with me told me that in her feedback, it was mentioned that uh, the diagnosis, differential diagnosis were not adequate. And there are others who have said the same thing, that when you are talking about differential diagnosis, you need to make sure that your differential diagnosis match with your uh, with the information you got in history. So this is another skill that you will have to develop based on the presenting complaint and positive findings. You should be able to put the differentials in the order of their likelihood. And they can there can be a little bit of uh, mess up in this order, but still, um, if you start with something which is extremely unlikely, but could be one of the possible differential diagnoses, your chances of passing the exam becomes very low because then they feel like you are not sure about what you are dealing with. The third thing is physical examination. Now, unlike AIMS clinical examination, here in physical examination, you don't need to get into the details of how you would do the actual steps. It's more like you talk about the headings. So as an example, if they ask you to do the exam, thyroid examination, you might say that I will start with the thyroid eye signs and then I'll do the examination of the neck. I'm just giving you an overview. Basically, you don't need to explain in detail about uh, how what you expect uh, in the eyebrows, what you expect in the leads, what you expect in the eyeballs pro propping out. I mean, you don't need to get into the details. Just mentioning that I'll look for the thyroid eye signs will be enough. And if they want to know more, they will let you know that. So can you explain to us what those eye signs are? Otherwise, if they feel like you know about these things, they will not get into the details. Uh, so how you should prepare your approach to physical examination is you will mostly have I think one or two minutes, because in my exams, I had only one or two minutes to talk about physical examination. And I only gave them the headings like these are the things I want to check. And they were happy with that. They didn't say anything. They didn't even ask me to explain those steps further. One thing that we don't usually use in AMC clinical examination, but very often use in PASCI is screening tools. General practitioners use a lot of screening tools. These are like the questionnaires that they use to rule out or rule in certain diagnoses or certain conditions. For example, mini nutritional assessment, K10 scale, or DAS21. So these are some of the screening tools, the questionnaires that GPs often use in real practice. And you should be aware of them. And you should know when to use them. And you should have a basic understanding of how to interpret them. If you don't remember the exact cut of his course, like below this is normal, above this is abnormal, that's fine. But at least you should know that this has, once you do the questionnaires, the screening, these are the possible outcomes. And for that, you look at the cutoff value on the reference document. You can say that, but you need to know that there's something like that exists. Then office tests, because GPs often do office tests, so you should be uh, familiar with different office tests done by GPs and how to interpret them. In my case, uh, there was one case where I had to do the office test and the diagnosis was made on the basis of that office test. So you will have to include them in your structure, office test, because sometimes the positive findings perhaps will be only the office test. And then based on that, you'll have to make your diagnosis. And of course, you need to know about the common investigations and their interpretations. One thing, again, you will find different here compared to AMC clinical examination is in AMC clinical examination, when we talk about investigations, we talk about a bunch of investigations, like we will do this, this, and this, 
But here, they expect you to do the investigations in sequence. Usually in general practice, we don't order a horde of investigations at the same time. Generally, it happens in a sequence. You do some investigations first, and based on the findings of that, you go further. And that's how they want you to do this. One of my friends uh, who had done this exam around two years ago had told me uh, that in his exam, because he was successful, uh, unsuccessful twice, so he told me that in one of his feedback, they had mentioned that the candidate is not aware of the common investigations and the sequence of investigations, which means they want you to do the investigations in a more economic, economical manner. They don't want you to just order everything that you can think of because, you know, here it is subsidized by Medicare. So if you are not careful with what you are ordering, then, then you are just increasing the load on the Medicare. That's why they want you to start with some basic investigations, uh, what you can expect from those investigations and what you will do after that. And I'll talk about this when I'll talk about the cases I got in the exam because they also asked me the same thing when I was um, answering questions about investigations in my exam cases. They asked me like, which investigation would you want to do first? Rather than asking which investigations, what investigations will you do? And so I answered in the same way. There are some basic investigations, but these are the two investigations that I can do to find out uh, the diagnosis, or I mean to ascertain the diagnosis. And based on that, I will follow up with more investigations. So we'll talk about that later. So investigations, you need to know which should be the best initial test and which would be the confirmatory test. If you try to think in this way, it will be quite helpful rather than thinking about all the possible tests you can do. And the other thing is they also want you to know if you are able to identify the emergency conditions or not. If you are able to decide whether the patient needs the treatment right now, that means the patient needs emergency treatment in treatment room, or the patient has a little bit of time and during that time, you can send to hospital without doing any treatment in the clinic, which will depend on the distance of the hospital from the clinic as well. And the third is the patient requires any treatment or just a lifestyle modification and ancillary services, because they don't want you to treat the patient in every cases. There are some diagnosis where you can start with the lifestyle modification and ancillary services before you start with the pharmacotherapies or surgical therapies. So that is another thing that you'll have to know. So basically what it means is if I talk about uh, uh, an important differentiating feature between AMC clinical and PESCI examination, AMC clinical is more about how much you know and PESCI is how much you can use that in the real scenario. Whether you, can, you are able to use your knowledge to help a patient in the real scenario or not, which means you'll be making decisions based on patient's positive findings. And rather than saying everything that you know, you will talk about what the what is relevant in case of patient. How would you do it in real world? That's what they want to see from you. So they want to see a doctor who is going to practice, not uh, a student who knows things, but is yet to learn how to use those things. I hope that will help you to get uh, a brief understanding of what they expect you in terms of knowledge. Now, the next important thing that you need to pass this exam, which obviously all of you know, is your communication skills. Communication skills is extremely important. It's extremely important. And this is something even my supervisor has shared with me, the clinic owner where I'm, I'll be working has shared with me and other doctors have shared with me that if you don't have good communication skills, it's not just about dealing with the patient. It's also about you dealing with the other colleagues, sharing the information, getting the information, using the information. All of that will require you to have good communication skills. Now, English is our second language. So sometimes we can have problem with using the right word. The solution to this for the exam is you should be able to anticipate what is coming in the exam and should have some pre-prepared structures to use in the exam. For example, how to start the conversation. So you have a patient that you want to start the consultation. What will be your first line? How would you follow that line up, uh, line with? And what would you ask to explore the concerns further? So you need to know about these things. And if the patient has not said something, or if you feel that you are not exactly sure what the patient is saying, then you need to ask further. If the patient says, I feel tired all the time, you have to you have to clarify what kind of tiredness they are talking about. It is mental tiredness, physical tiredness. If they say, I'm feeling dizzy all the time, you have to explore that further, what they mean by that. If they feel, I feel lightheaded, you have to explore further to 
uh, clarify what that is. And especially in Australia, they are very notorious for using different slangs. And I think we don't even understand 10% of the slangs they use here. There are so many of them. It's always a good idea to ask them what they actually mean when they say that. Like feeling funny, funny tones. Funny tones could be lightheadedness. Funny tones could be dizziness. You need to ask them clearly, what do you mean by that? And until they give you an, uh, a complaint that you can objectively define as something, you should ask that. And the reason these kind of words are used in the exam is because they want to see whether you will do this in the exam or not. They are not trying to assess whether you know about the slangs or not, but they want to see whether you know what to do when patient is using slangs and you are finding it difficult to understand their communication. Signposting is another thing that I think many of us struggle with. When you move from one point to another point, you have to make it clear to the uh, patient what you are trying to say, when which topic you are going to now and why you are doing that. Because that's something I did in my exam a lot. Whenever I would move from one part to the, uh, the other, I would give some time for the patient to understand that now we are moving to the other part. So every time I would go from, for example, family history, personal history to family history, then I would say like something like, okay, let's talk a few things about your family if this, that is all right with you. This gives you an opportunity to show your communication skills. This helps you to build rapport with the patient. And this also shows to the panel that you know how to communicate properly and professionally with your patient. So signposting, make sure that you do that during your role plays when you're practicing, it's really important. Now, based on um, the experience of myself and many other people who are preparing for this exam, the only thing that will help you to pass this exam in addition to communication skills and your knowledge is your structured approach. If someone asks me like, what are three things you will need to pass the exam? I'll say that know what you need to deal with, make sure you can communicate that well to the patient so that you can ask questions or you, you can explain to the patient and make sure you can do it in a structured manner so that you don't skip or miss any important points and develop your own structure. I have done it for myself. I'll share that with you guys as well. But what I think you should do is don't copy my structure and use it. Change it. I got my structure based on the information I got from different tutors, from different resources, from different books. But what I did was I changed that so that the language was comfortable for me, the order was comfortable for me, and the order was intuitive for me so that I could not forget in the exam, even if I was under pressure. So that's something you'll have to do. Take someone's format, add your things, remove things you think you don't need, and then change it into your way. And try to use that during your role plays. Try to use your structure. Make sure that you, your structure is flexible enough because sometimes if it is too rigid, then it may not be relevant to ask some of the questions you have in your structure. And the other thing is, this is, I think, another important thing that I have seen when I discuss people in AMC Clinical mostly, uh, that because in AMC Clinical also I have, we have these routine questions that we ask, like, do you have any allergies or do you, do you drink alcohol? Do you smoke? Even if it is already mentioned in the STEM, STEM that patient is a non-smoker, a patient is patient does not consume al alcohol because it's in the structure. Some people just keep asking those questions which are not relevant or asking about travel when it is not even relevant to the patient. So let's say that the patient is presenting with breast lump and you're asking, have you recently traveled anywhere? Now, if you have a rational, let's say that you have read somewhere and you know how travel can have can lead to a breast lump, that's fine as long as you can rationalize it, you have an explanation behind it. Otherwise, don't ask questions just for the sake of asking, especially in Pesky, because they're here, they want you to do it in the way you will do in the real world. So asking someone about uh, travel when uh, they are presenting with breast lump perhaps will not be that much relevant. So these are the things you will have to keep in mind. And every time patient gives you a positive point, you have to explore it further, no matter what it is. If the patient says that, I think my pain gets better when I lie on the left side, you have to ask further about that because that's a positive point. If the patient says, I can't sleep, you have to ask more questions about sleep. So if the patient says, I can't sleep, don't, don't just move to the next point. First, ask questions about sleep. Even if you miss the other uh, questions, it's it's fine. Because maybe the, the main point was that point about sleep. And if you don't ask further, you'll not get it. But what I have seen is because we are 
to, under this assumption that we have to ask all the questions in our structure. Even if we have got a positive point, we feel under the pressure to ask the remaining questions. And we feel like we are running against the time. And then rather than exploring the positive com complaint, we move forward to ask other routine questions, which may not be relevant to the, uh, the case at all. So this is one important thing that I think uh, some of us may need to practice. If there is any positive point, exploring that point further is more important than asking other routine questions, which eventually will be perhaps negative. So this is not important, but this is important. So this is the part where you should be focusing more when you are using a structured approach to ask questions. Now, there are other important skills as well, of course, but these are the three important skills that I think you will need to pass the exam. Of course, the other skills, there are some um, softer skills you will need, like um, you can speak politely, you can speak with smile where it is needed, you can be empathetic, you feel confident when you're asking questions, you don't hesitate uh, while asking questions, you know which question to ask next without doing um or without using too many fillers. These are these things are important. Sometimes what happens is what I have felt myself is when you're communicating with someone who has good knowledge but but uses a lot of fillers, you feel like that person doesn't know or is not confident. So let's say ask, I'm asking a relevant question, but I say, um, okay, um, so do you also have? Um, if I start doing this, the other person gets the impression that this guy is actually not sure about what he's what he wants from me, or the panel may feel like this person does not even know what he is trying to do or what she is trying to do. My approach in these cases is if I feel like I'm not exactly sure what to ask next, next uh, rather than using the fillers, I just stay silent. I pause. I take a meaningful pause because that feels like I'm trying to think without making the other person feel that I'm not confident about what I'm going to ask. For example, I took a pause here because I want to ask some questions but I don't know which questions to ask. So I'm taking pauses here. These are meaningful pauses, which avoid fillers. Fillers are almost unavoidable, uh, but try to minimize them as much as possible. The other thing they say is know your limits. Don't talk about things that you don't know how to handle. If you are under the impression that if I say more than I'll pass the exam, then perhaps you are wrong because most of us will be applying for level one supervision. APRA these days does not allow people to practice uh, in any level other than level one, if someone has not practiced in Australia before or does not have an extended amount of experience. So if you know your limits, like this is this is the moment where I need to go to my supervisor and ask them questions. So, or these are the things that I will have to ask my supervisor. I think that will that will be in your favor. And I will tell you some of the things I did in the exam in which I told the panel that I don't know this answer, but I know how to find the answer. I will tell you how I did that as well. Knowing your limits is perhaps the most important thing when it comes to safety, because people who know what they don't know are safer compared to people who have this, this misunderstanding about what they know. They can do more damage. If you know some, if you feel like you know something, but you don't actually know it, then you are more likely to do the damage compared to someone who knows he or she doesn't know. Be familiar with the Australian health system, which is not that easy because there are so many things and it can actually consume all of your time if you focus too much on this. Just know about some basic things like what is MBS, what is PBS, uh, team care arrangement, this kind of things, what is um, uh, this uh, crisis admission team, these kind of things. Just be familiar with these things, but don't go in too much detail about this because they will not ask you too much about it. They, they, expect you to learn these things when you start working. So if you can mention a few things, it should be more than enough. And the other important thing is know where you can find further help. So you should have some resources in mind. When they ask you like, okay, how do you deal with this? And you don't have any answer. You should be able to say, okay, I'll look up this in this particular resource. Like I look this up in therapeutic guidelines or in community health pathways or in Australian medicine handbook. And this question, I'll ask my supervisor, or with the consent of my supervisor, I'll call the specialist and ask about this. I'll let my patient know that I need to ask my supervisor about this, or I'll let my patient know that I need to discuss with a specialist about this problem. Because that's what actually happens in real practice as well. When I was doing my observation, I have seen my supervisor calling the specialist many times about different questions he used to have. So it's very common for 
general practitioners to do these things here, even if they know, because there is a, there is always risk of litigation, there is always this risk of having legal problems. They have conversation with the specialist before they make any risk decisions. So it's quite natural or it's quite acceptable for us to mention that, okay, I'll do this. I'll look this up here. I'll speak with my supervisor or I'll call the specialist and get information from the specialist. So these are the things you should know when to use them or in which conditions you cannot say that, which is not acceptable. That's also important. You can't say that I'll look that up in therapeutic guidelines uh, when someone is having, let's say, anaphylaxis and you want to find out the dose of adrenaline. You can because it's it's an emergency situation. By the time you find out how much dose to give to the patient, the patient may have already collapsed and died. So that's one thing. Now, what you don't need to pass pace key. Now, this is based on the things I did, but I never had to use in the exam. Uh, when, I'll tell you how much time I used, uh, how much time I prepared for pace key and what I did during that time. I did a lot of things which I eventually realized were not important. But the reason I was doing them was because before I started my pesky preparation, I spoke with a few of my friends who had done this exam before. I spoke with them. I asked them how to do this. And there were some of my friends who were doing some courses with different tutors. And they told me that their tutors had told them these, these things. And then because I was not taking any classes from anywhere, so I relied on that information. But eventually what I realized a few days before the exam and in the exam, was that IME is doing PESKI in a different manner than ACRAM and, and RSGP are doing. If your tutors have not been to IME exam, perhaps they will have very little understanding of how IME is conducting the exam. I'm not trying to generalize and I'm not criticizing anyone, but what I'm trying to say is, if you know more, of course, it might help you in the long term, but in the short term, knowing a lot can overwhelm you. And you may lose your focus. And just a few days before the exam, you will feel like, I don't know what to do now. Which points are important for me to revise? Or where I need to focus more? And that can be a problem. In other words, what I'm saying is, if you are planning to climb Mount Everest, make sure your backpack is not heavy. Otherwise, before you reach the summit, you will feel too tired to do anything at all. And that happened to me. Because I tried to do so many things, which I eventually realized were not what they were expecting from me. Every now and then I would ask my supervisor some questions and his response usually would be, why are you asking me these questions? These questions are at the level of fellowship. And why are you asking me this question? I don't think you need to know about these things. He would answer eventually, but that's what he used to say. And I used to feel, why is he saying that? Maybe he doesn't know the answer. But the truth was he was actually giving me the clue that I was going a little more than what I should have. Now, that's not bad because I feel more confident because of doing all those things. I know more about treatment. I know more about the uh, services we can use, different ancillary services, how to use them. But none of them were asked in the exam. And if you ask other candidates, many of them will tell you the same thing. The focus is on something different. So ACRAM and RCCP, my understanding is they focus a lot on management, diff using different protocols, different guidelines, what to do if one uh, treatment doesn't work, doses of some medications, in what frequency or for how much, uh, how long, those kind of things are more important for RCCP and ACRAM, I think. But for IME, I don't think that is important because every time they ask about treatment, the moment I mentioned the treatment, they didn't ask me any other questions. They simply moved to the next question which shows that they are not that much fussy about the actual treatment protocol. Maybe because that's something they expect us to learn in level one supervision, or maybe because we can find that information either through different resources or by asking our supervisor. But they want us to have a basic understanding of how to approach the patient and practice medicine safely as a general practice. Now, maybe because of that. Now, let me tell you the things that I think we don't need to pass this exam. First is you don't need to know in-depth um, about all the cases. So let's say that you are dealing with a case of atrial fibrillation. You don't need to know all the protocols about when to start the rate control, when to start the rhythm control, how to anticoagulate the patient, how long to anticoagulate the patient, and when can you refer the patient for echocardiography. These kind of things, It's these are good to know and will help you eventually in the long term. For, but for this exam, you just need to know the basics, that the options we have are rate control, rhythm control, and just the way we did in AMC clinical exam in IME, if you just mentioned that there are options of rate control, rhythm control, and then this decision will be made by the 
specialist. But before sending the patient to the specialist, I will discuss this with my supervisor. That is an acceptable answer at this level. So as I've already mentioned, dose is frequency, except when you are talking about emergency medicine or there are important differences in the treatment protocol, uh, you don't need to, you are not expected to know that. Now, when I say this important differences, what do I mean? Let me explain this a little bit more. So emergency medicines, everyone knows what I mean by that. These are the ones that you must know because you will not have time to look them up. But important differences, it, this is based on the questions asked by the panel and based on the recall, this information. So for example, if someone has shingles, and let's say someone has genital herpes. So in one of the interviews, the panel asked the member, like, what dose of medicine will you use? Uh, and then I started wondering. I thought that they would not ask about doses. So why are they asking about the doses? The reason was, if you think about a cyclovir as the treatment here, a cyclovir dose in singles is you use 800 mz. But if you look at genital herpes, you use that at 400 mz. And frequency here is like five times. Frequency here is three times. So there are, although you are using the same medication, antiviral medication for two different conditions, you can see the dosing is half the dose you require for shingles. And that's why they want to know whether you know about these things or not. And let's say that you don't know, you can mention that you will look that up. You will look that up or you will speak with your supervisor. In many situations, I've seen that they accept this as the correct answer. In fact, I have seen that when reading the recalls, I found that there are a lot of wrong answers and despite that the candidates had passed as an example there was someone who had the um, case of thyroiditis and in that case the thyroiditis case there was i think um, hyperthyroidism and they had asked like how would you treat the patient and the patient had and the candidate had mentioned that they would use this carbamazole or propyl thiouracil and that we don't do that because this is a transient hyperthyroidism and if you know this is thyroiditis you simply give the pain medication uh, or the anti-inflammatory medications if pain is too severe you give prednisone you wait for around four to six weeks repeat and then if it is still there then only you think about the treatment so that was the wrong answer but it's still the candidate passed or the other one was the case of dumping syndrome where um they asked like how are you going to diagnose it that the patient and the candidate say that i'm going to do the uh, this glucose tolerance test and for dumping syndrome diagnosis if your plan is to do the glucose tolerance test you have to do it in a setting where there are enough resources to 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 stabilize the patient because in patients with dumping syndrome positivity can be dangerous as it can cause severe hypoglycemia but it's still the candidate passed but in both the answers what i had seen at that time was they had mentioned that but i'll confirm this with my supervisor so at least they have created that safety margin there so maybe because of that they felt the candidate was safe enough so if you're not sure don't mention it but if you think uh, you have to mention still tag that part saying that i will speak with my supervisor about this now these are some of my general impressions and now i want to talk about how i prepared for my exam what methods i used what resources i used how much time i spent on my preparation before that if anyone has any questions please ask so that we can discuss that feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions if you don't have any questions, we can simply move to the next part. Hi, doctor. Hello. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'd just like to ask you, um, I understand that uh, for the interview, it is important to ask the patient if the patient is an, a native Australian. So um, how do we ask it politely? Uh, would you advise us on that? Um, first, let me first make sure that I understood your question clearly. So your question is, we, do we have to ask them if they are native Australians or not? Is it? Yeah. yeah. And if yes, how do we ask? Generally speaking, in, in the real practice as well, I think if people are speaking clearly and we can understand them well, I don't think this question is important to ask in the beginning because I did not do this in my exam. I never asked whether they were native Australians or not. But asking about whether the patients are from the ATSI group or not, 
is important only when it is relevant. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes because ATSI groups are considered marginalized or disadvantaged group in Australia. And because of that, they have higher health risks and there are certain conditions which are more common in them. The treatment protocols are different. So asking this question can be relevant. But if someone is communicating with me clearly, is communicating in clear English, asking whether they are Australians or not, which will not make any big difference in my approach. There are certain conditions which are more prevalent in certain ethnic groups. And when I feel like it could be one of them, then perhaps it will be more relevant to ask that. If I feel like it could be a case of thalassemia, then perhaps asking that question will be important. Or if I feel like the patient is presenting with hepatitis B, then I can ask that which country they are from, if they are from any endemic country or not. Or if someone is presenting with the signs and symptoms of tuberculosis, perhaps that will be important. Otherwise, I don't think that makes a big difference. But I didn't do it, and I wouldn't do it if someone would ask me. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, doctor. So example now, uh, example when it comes to the aborigine uh, group. So mm -hmm. uh, we know that, uh, just let's just say for the uh, sake of discussion, the next mm -hmm. is the diabetes case. Mm -hmm. So um, so do we ask, like for example, maybe I could just uh, give it an example and you could correct me. So do I mm -hmm. ask them, um, uh, dear Mary, are you part of an aboriginal group? Are you part of the tribe? So how do we ask it in a, okay. ask it in a very polite way so that we don't upset the patient okay so the way we do this is you can simply ask the patient you can use the exact same sentence as i'm using do you identify yourself as aboriginal or tourist tourist street islander patient or tourist street, street islander people do you identify yourself as and then whatever you want to ask after that because okay. according to the cultural guidelines of New South Wales. I don't know about the federal guidelines, but according to the cultural guidelines of New South Wales, and I would assume that it's the same, that anyone can assume themselves as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander based on their lineage. So this is not uh, uh, an affliction that we give to someone based on certain characteristics, but this is something that they decide. There are cases where, let's say that uh, father is Aboriginal, mother is not, and the child does not identify herself as aboriginal. So if that is the case, then you cannot call her aboriginal. If the child says, yes, I uh, identify myself as, as aboriginal, then you have to accept that patient is aboriginal. That's what the cultural guidelines is. So whether or not someone says they're aboriginal is up to them to decide. Just like how we now are approaching the issue of gender, whether or not someone thinks they are male or female is up to them to decide. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much, doctor. Okay. Now, moving on to the next part, that is uh, my preparation, how I did it. So the first question that uh, I want to answer is, which is also the most frequently asked question that people have privately asked me, it's like, how much time did you spend on this? I first spoke with many of my friends who had done this exam. And they suggested that I spend around two months. And that's what I did. I booked my exam two months after the date I thought I would start preparing for the exam. So my total preparation time was two months date-wise. So I started from the 18th of July because I booked my exam on the 17th of July. My exam was on the 20th of September. I started from the 18th of July. I slowed down from the 8th of September. I started... Um, studying for only one or two hours from 8th of September. And by 15th of September, I completely stopped studying. So from 15th until the 19th, I did not study at all. And 20th, I just um, stayed downstairs in my, at my home. And then I watched a movie because my interview started from 11. And before that, I wanted to calm my nerves. So I started watching a movie so that I would not think too much about exam. So that's what I did. And so if... If you ask me like exactly how many days, then perhaps you can do a calculation there. But that's how I did it, around two months. And every day I would study for six to seven hours. Every day I would study for six to seven hours when I would study. And sometimes I pretend to study more 
but I would not be able to focus more than six or seven hours. Uh, but I would stay in front of the computer pretending to study so that I would not have to cook food for my wife who would come back from work. So that was a bit selfish of me. Um, but I would just tell her that, yeah, I'm studying. But honestly, uh, I would not study for more than six to seven hours every day. And I would never study on Sunday. Sunday was my break day and Friday evening. Friday evening, I would take time to win down a little bit. And um, the reason I'm telling you this is studying is important, but recharging yourself is also equally important. If you keep studying after some time, I think your attention span, your ability to focus, everything starts going down and you'll not be able to study as effectively as you want to. So every now and then you should take a break. The other thing is I would study six to seven hours. But what I used to do was I would study for one or two hours. Then I would watch a series, one episode. I would finish that and then I would start studying again. That way I would not feel bored. So during these two months, I have finished many web series that I was planning to watch. And I could not because of my AMC exam. So I, I have I finished um, this new suit on Netflix. And the other one, um, young Selden, I'm about to uh, finish the uh, fourth season and I think they have just dropped fifth season. So which I will start watching. And so, yeah, so I was taking a break before my study as well. So that was my total duration for study. Regarding the resources, uh, the first resource I used was AMC Clinical Notes, which I had prepared for my AMC Clinical Exam. They helped me a lot because uh, the AMC Notes, my AMC Notes were based on the Marwan Notes and the uh, Lipsy files. And then I had added different information from different resources. So for my um, base key preparation, what I simply did was I selected the topics they were asking in the exam, and then I added extra information. So I'll take this moment to share with you my notes on the screen so that you can see what I mean. Um, let me first find my notes. Okay. And I think I need to stop Just sharing first. No. Okay. So, so perhaps you can see my Obsidian notice screen here. So you can see these were the indexes that I had prepared for my Base key preparation. So I have this base key index where I have the case list according to different subjects. And these are linked back to my notes. And you can see on the side here that I have this beautiful graph which shows the relationship between different concepts I learned while preparing for my exam. And basically, I have all these topics here. And then I prepared the approach to different scenarios, like how to explain the investigations, how to talk about management, how to talk about community care, what language to use, how to approach an unstable patient, how to explain physical examination. So these were like the approach to different scenario, and these were the actual scenarios that they had asked in the exam. Let me show you inside this as well. Uh, so let's say that this is acne case. So this is the uh, acne case they have asked in the exam. So this is the whole scenario here. And then these are the different things uh, that we were, were expected to do. And then you can see that these um, the classification, investigations, management, treatment, different treatment protocols, different possible scenarios. So these are some of the snippets from therapeutic guidelines with some highlights that I thought were important for me. So this is how I prepared my notes. So basically what I did was, because in AMC Clinical, you are not expected to know these things. But my friends had told me that you need to know about management in depth. So I got all this information from therapeutic guidelines, but I don't think this is necessary. Now I know that this is not necessary for the exam. For your own learning, yes, you can do this, but for the exam, it's not important, it's not necessary, but this is how I prepared my notes. And this graph here, let me see if I can show you the graph. Um, so basically the local graph, this helped me in connecting the concepts together because in our exam, it's very important that we can use a clinical reasoning to find out possible diagnosis. And for that, we have to know how different concepts we know are related to each other. So basically, if I increase the depth, then it, it brings me to this screen here. 
where I can see different topics that I'm reading and then how they are linked to the different concepts I already know. Anyway, we don't need to get into details of this, but what I'm trying to say is I basically used the notes I already had using Obsidian. If anyone is interested in using Obsidian, perhaps you can find about it on YouTube as well, or you can ask me. I find it really, really helpful, especially for the medical students or medical practitioners because what it does is it connects what you know with what you have already read before. So like endometriosis is related to Mirena or female infertility. And if I click on female infertility, it brings me to another screen where it shows me the different things which are related to that and so on. So this is how I studied. And this was fun because I love doing these things. So I felt, I never felt like I was, you know, doing something boring. I would just read, would add information, and then that would expand the repertoire of my knowledge, would show me how different things I'm reading are connected to each other. And that was improving my reasoning skills, I think. And that helped me in the exam. And I'll talk about that when we will talk about the cases, like how I use this knowledge when I was um, explaining to the panel. So this was the first thing I used, my Obsidian uh, knowledge bank. The second thing is Anki. So those of you who may have watched my video about how I prepared for MC Clinical, perhaps have seen me using Anki there. So Anki is basically a flashcard tool. And in Anki, I have, I think, more than 4,000 flashcards. So for Pesky, what I did was I went through the flashcards and tagged the cards which I thought were relevant to Pesky as Pesky. So I added that tag, and then uh, I could just use the filter to create different decks. So let me show you that. Now, some of you may find that all these things are a bit overwhelming and not making sense. And I'm sorry if that's the case, but uh, I think these are the things that helped me in getting a good outcome in the exam. That's why I'm sharing it. So let me share my Anki deck. And by the way, Obsidian notes, uh, I don't know how to share it with the community, so I have not been able to do that. But Anki flashcards, if anyone is interested, please let me know after this session because I can download the Anki flashcards the offline version, and then I can share it with you, and you can use them in your own uh, Anki deck. So let me show you. I don't know why it is not showing up here. Okay. So this is Anki. So you can see here that on Anki, I have different decks. And because I have this Ambos subscription, you can, um, it links with Ambos, Ambos, uh, the database where I can read about different things if I don't understand them. So I have this archive where I have more than 3000 cards. And out of those cards, I created this pesky deck, which has, I think around 300 and something cards. And I, would read around 200 cards at one time and basically it would just show me these kind of things and if i would not want to know more about anything i would just hover over and then because of ambos it would show me more information and if i want to read more because i feel like i don't know much about it i simply click on this and then it opens that topic on ambos and then i can read it in more detail so that's how i would do it i would do anki not every day Unlike in AMC Clinical, AMC Clinical, I used to do it every day, but for Pesky, because I knew most of the cards already had already memorized most of the cards, I would simply do it maybe two or three times a week. And I would spend around one hour or so on doing Anki. And that boosted my confidence of being able to recall the information at the right time. So this is something that many people use. Anki is used a lot by medical students. I have been using this for, I think, but now almost 10 years now. And I've used it for my AMC MCQ exam. I've used it for AMC clinical, and I also used it sparingly for a PESCI exam. So that was the second thing I used for my preparation. Going back to the third thing was um, this. So I will not go into the details of that, but I'll just show you the third thing that I had used. Uh, that was something called TikTok. The basically, not TikTok, sorry, TikTik. So TikTik is basically uh, a task manager. So what I used to do in the morning was in TikTik, I would just list the number of topics that I would read on that day and I would mark the time when I would read them. So I would read this from 10 to 12, this from 12 to 2 and so on. And TikTik has this focus mode. So once you start the focus mode, it just, you know, uh, disables everything and you can do uh, your study without be being distracted. So 
that was the other thing. And that way, what would happen is at the end of the day, because it shows you the graph, like how many hours you studied and what you did during those hours, which topics you studied. And if I felt like, okay, I have studied this topic today, but I still don't remember anything and I'm not feeling confident, I would just mark it for the other day, maybe next Tuesday, next Thursday. So that way, because the important thing is not how much you studied. The important thing is how much you remembered and how much confident you feel about those topics. So at, at, at in the evening, I would just review. I have read this six topics today and I don't feel confident about this. So that one I will mark for spaced repetition for the next day or maybe after two days and so on. So Mary is asking me, is Obsidian a paid software? No, Obsidian is free. It's free. You can download it from their website, obsidian.md, and it's a free software. And it is really useful, but it's a bit complicated to use in the beginning and many people find it a bit overwhelming, but with time it gets better. You, you feel more comfortable using it because when I started, I used to feel a bit um, overwhelmed looking at the interface and looking at the different things I could do. But now it has almost become a part of my learning. I read journals and everything that is automatically imported to Obsidian. So I use a different service. I will not get into the details of that. Um, so whenever I read journals on the internet, I highlight the journals and write my notes. And I use a service called Readwise, which automatically pulls all those highlights and then create a note on Obsidian. So on Obsidian, all the topics which have any reference to the articles I read on the internet will be automatically linked. So anytime I would be reading about Syncopy, let's say Syncop, uh, and let's say that I have read a journal about Syncop two years ago, then Obsidian automatically finds a link between the two. So basically, it shows me, okay, Syncop, this is your note, but you have also read these articles in the past. So I can go back there and then read about it again. I think it's getting a bit, bit overwhelming, so I will not talk about this. Maybe some other time, if anyone is interested, we can talk about that. And I got uh, some notes from my good friends who shared their notes with me. That is one of the reasons I'm sharing my notes with others, because I think that if someone helped me to pass this exam, then I should also help others to pass their exam. So I had some notes from my friends, which I used to create my notes. I, and I think this is really important. Don't rely on other people's notes. Use them as a resource. Use them as a kind of a uh, the backdrop on which you develop your own material. Because your notes are more readable and more retainable than the notes that you get from others. So you don't know the reference point of other people when reading their notes, why they wrote in that particular way. But when you will write your notes, not only you will be writing in the way you understand better, but the process of writing also helps you in retaining the information. And I did this. I made my own notes. References. I use Community Pathway a lot. I'm not sure how many of you know about Community Pathway, but if you're preparing for Pesky, you must read Community Pathway. Different regions have different Community Pathway websites. I'm located in Mid-North Coast in New South Wales, so I use Mid-North Coast um, Community Pathway website. There is a lot of information. You don't need to know all of them. You just need to get some basic understanding of how to approach a case and what kind of treatment you can offer and what are the local services available in your area. Because uh, in Pesky, it's quite likely that they might ask you about those things. So community, help, community Pathway will help you with that. And this is free website, but it has username and password. So you'll not be able to access it without username and password, but it's a common username and password. So if anyone is interested, I can share my username and password with you, but that will be for mid North Coast. Uh, if you're in Melbourne, I think in Melbourne also, they have, they have just one website for Melbourne, so you can get it from someone and you can use it. The other thing is therapeutic guidelines. Every one of you perhaps knows that therapeutic guidelines is like the most uh, reliable resource that people use here. And um, I used it a lot. Although not all the information from therapeutic guidelines were used during my exam, but still I feel more confident because I read it. Yeah, Natalia has a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, I would like to clarify about uh, Readwise. Uh, so I need contact you to get this uh, app, or can I find it in other store? Um, what we can do is after this session, if you want to know more about it, you can send me a direct message on Telegram or on Messenger, and Thank then I'll you. I'll give you the link. Thank you. Okay. So ETG is quite valuable, and I also found I had never read. It is easy before. 
I had read community pathway while preparing for MC clinical, but not ETG. But this time I read ETG because I had already read community pathway. So there was no point reading that again. So I only read it uh, for a few topics, but I mostly read ETG and I have read almost, I wouldn't say all the topics, but most of the topics of ETG. I read most of the topics. Uh, and I felt quite good reading that because it's very clearly written. Everything is clearly given. The other thing that uh, not many people use based on my understanding is Australian Medicine Handbook. So this is another subscription-based website which is prepared by the RCGP along with other stakeholders. One basic difference between ETG and AMH is ETG is more case-focused, uh, presentation-focused, whereas AMH is more medicine-focused, like it's more about the treatment that you give to the patient. So if you go to ETG, for example, and look for... Uh, look for the information about acne treatment to give you the treatment like like benzoyl peroxide or or like retinoids and so on. But what AMH does is it also gives you the information about benzoyl peroxide, what are the different brands available in the market, and what are the side effects and so on. So you might say then it's similar to MIMS, but I prefer AMH because it's clearly written, well explained, and then there are some practice tips which I find really valuable. I read AMH and it's good. So GP Learning, uh, this is again a paid subscription service. I'm a member and I use it. I use the Czech series from Jan to uh, the latest one, which is about the aesthetics. aesthetics. Um, uh, somebody told me that you have to do Czech. I did. I don't think it's necessary for IME. That's my, my impression. It will help you because you'll learn things, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary for IME. And I also did a lot of other lessons on GP learning, like approach to different uh, skin malignancies or skin rashes, approach to knee pain, approach to this and that. And their, their way of doing things is slightly different than how you would be asked question in the exam. I don't know if it indirectly helped me in some ways, but directly I don't think it helped me. I read a lot of HGP articles. Uh, then I already told you that I use Readwise for this. So Readwise has a reader app. So I would just read the articles. I would first import them on Reader and then I would highlight them. And that hi those highlights would be collected into OneNote, which would be exported to Obsidian. Then I would go to Obsidian and would read them there. John Murtak is a very popular resource. Many people use it. Unfortunately, I could not use it this time as well for the simple reason that the treatment in John Murtak, some of the treatment I felt we're not up to date and uh, I'm not criticizing. It's one of the most highly regarded books, so I cannot um, criticize it, but I did not read it because I just felt like I had already read a lot of other things and I didn't have any time. The other question I have got from people is like, did you take any training classes? I did not, based on advice of one of my friends who had done the exam before. Uh, he told me that because you have already done AMC Clinical, I don't think you'll be able to extract much value from the classes as you'll only be learning 10 or 20% extra. And for that, you'll be paying a good sum of money. So again, this is an individual decision. It's up to you to decide whether or not you want to do the training classes. If you haven't done AMC Clinical before or you have no idea about that, it's better to take these classes because they will help you to develop a structure, make you familiar with the Australian system, treatment guidelines, and so on. But if you have done AMC Clinical before, you have already passed it, you are very confident about your ability, then in that case, I think if you just gather some materials from your friends, read the resources I have told you about, it should be enough. There is no need to take the class. This is, again, my impression. And the other thing I did for my preparation was every time I would I'd be reading, I would create a list of questions I would want to ask my supervisor. So I used to use Apple Note for that. So I would ask, I would just create a checklist of questions to ask my supervisor. So every time I would go there, I would ask the question, I would just tick them like I have already asked these questions, these questions I still need to ask. That would help me to keep track of the things that I was, uh, that the questions I was asking from my supervisor. And other thing, important thing is because this is something they had asked me, the panel had asked me in the beginning the demographics of the area of practice. Before this, I read the um, the Australian Bureau of Statistics website. I found out about the demographics of my place, number of male, female, the language is spoken, facilities around. So I read about all these things before going to the interview. And they asked me, and when they asked me, I was able to give a good and concise answer about uh, my, the area where I live, where I'll be practicing. Now, then after that, the next thing is role plays. People often ask, should we do role plays? 
I think role plays are important. If you ask me, I didn't do much because even in AMC Clinical, I didn't do much. I had a, role, uh, a study partner role play partner and she was very nice but we couldn't do that many role plays maybe because i was a bit reluctant to do role plays as i don't enjoy doing role plays much uh, but again this is a completely individual thing i think role plays are really important really valuable because they help you in improving your communication skills they help you in timing yourself they help you to learn to use your format and find out where you will struggle to use it properly so it's a it's a good way to improve your skills, but I didn't do it. Uh, but I think people should do it. Again, it's a, it's a personal decision. Think about what you would want to do and how comfortable you would feel doing the place. But if you feel like you have communication problems or timing problems, they are really helpful. And the most important is recalls. Like, should we do recalls or not? Absolutely, you should do recalls but you should not memorize the diagnosis of recalls. One of the common mistakes that people make when preparing for AMC clinical or PESKI is to memorize the diagnosis. So a person presenting with tiredness is this diagnosis. diagnosis. A lady presenting with limping is this diagnosis. You will have these positive findings. This is, I think, one of the worst ways to prepare for this exam, simply for the reason that you will then become biased. You will then become biased something we call confirmation bias. If you already have diagnosis in your mind based on the presenting complaint, you'll mostly ask the questions to confirm your diagnosis and you'll not be open enough to explore the possibilities of other diagnosis. And that is often the reason why people fail a case that they think they did quite well and they knew already. I use recall just to get familiar with the topics. Using the recalls, one of my, friend, one of my friends had shared with me i created the list of topics which i showed you earlier in obsidian and then i just prepared it in my way like if someone presents with neck lump how would i approach that case what would be the possible diagnosis how would i differentiate them based on the history or examination or investigations that's how i prepared so in my exam i'll show you my cases later on when they gave me the chief complaint i did not know what could be the possible diagnosis because i did not go through the recalls by memorizing the diagnosis i simply had to ask possible diagnosis questions and that's one of the reasons why i think uh, i was able to do better in the exam because i was not biased so use recalls to get familiar with the topic to find out how different diagnoses are asked in the exam like if they want to ask you about hemochromatosis usually what would be the positive findings for hemochromatosis not that the lady presenting with tiredness is a case of hemochromatosis but if they want uh, to give you the diagnosis of hemochromatosis, this will usually be the positive finding. If they want to give you the diagnosis of Addison's disease, this will usually be the positive finding in this way. That way, I think you will not be you will not be restricted to one particular diagnosis in the exam. So, yeah. So this is my opinion about recalls. Use of technology. These are some of the things I used. I will not get into the details. So this is all about what I did for my preparation, the resources I used, how I used them, the time I spent, and the, the trauma that I went through to prepare for the exam. Now I will talk about my 